Shalom, everyone. Oh, good. You're bilingual. All right. Maybe even more. I know. It's wonderful to be here with you this morning. Um, sorry, I, you know, about your pastor. Well, and um, like uh, Judy said, I'm, he's going to be great. And uh, of course, uh, my condolences on the loss of one of your church members. So we'll be, you know, praying for you for comfort. But the Lord is good, and it's great to be here with you this morning and to share with you from God's Word, a subject that's near and dear to my heart and the heart of our ministry. And again, I just thank you so much for having me. It's a real blessing uh, to be here with you this morning. Before we talk about the message today, I just want to share with you a little bit about our ministry and, and about a little bit about who I am. And, you know, the message will also bring some of that out. But our ministry, Chosen People Ministries, We've been around since 1894, and we were, you know, founded by uh, an Orthodox rabbi, and, and our heart, our desire, his heart desire, was to share the gospel with Jewish people, as we, as we like to say, Jewishly. And, and that's in a way that Jewish people can understand and, and really process through Messianic prophecy, through a Jewish testimony, and through the Jewish holy days and feasts, terminology, values that Jewish people can understand. And, and we want to be everywhere where there's a sizable Jewish population. And right here in the Bay Area, do you call it the Bay Area, San Francisco? What's the, I guess we'll say Bay Area. My uh, family member of mine, you know, lived uh, in this area for, for, and still does in the San Mateo Bay Area. Anyway, and, and there's uh, several hundred thousand, I think over 300,000 Jewish people living in the, in the greater Bay Area when you factor in Oakland, San Francisco, uh, the this area, the peninsula. And so, so as the West Regional Director, and, and I've, I've been on staff with Chosen People Ministries for 25 years, or it'll be 25 years this year in May. I've been the LA, Los Angeles, sorry, Los Angeles Branch Director for oh, over 20 years. And I just newly became the West Coast Regional Director. And so, um, so that's a, it's a great privilege. And, and the heart of, of my ministry is really... I know this is going to sound, I hope this doesn't sound strange, but the heart of my ministry is not really to the Jewish people, but it's to my family. And so I do have a, a picture of my family there. And, and, that, and that should be all of, our, um, all of our, I think, primary ministry. But they are they're supportive of uh, the work that we're doing to, with the Jewish people. And, and so that's my wife, Lisa. And then I have five boys. And I'm really blessed. They all uh, love the Lord. And and are um, really doing well. Three of them have already graduated college. I'm, I'm really excited to say that I've survived the teen years. My youngest is 20, just turned 20. And so we got through that, and it was a real, it's a real blessing. Two of them, my two younger ones, are just kind of wrapping up college. Well, one of them is going to be graduating. My, my number four is going to be David, man after God's own heart. Ironically, David is our artist, <laughs> so just like the David in the Bible, and, and he's going to be finishing college at Biola this um, May, and then my youngest is going to be, has two years left, and so then I'll, I can say, Lord willing, I, I survived getting my children through higher education, and, and that's a real blessing. And so I, Now, I was born and raised in the San Fernando Valley, so I, I don't even really like to say I'm from Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> just kidding for all you people from LA, but, but I, I, you know, and, and I want to just confess now that I voted in 2002 for the Valley to become its own city. I don't know if you knew that, but there was a vote, but LA got to vote too. And they said no, and there's a few more people there, but it, it anyway, so I was born and raised there. Now I went to UC Davis, ironically, I don't even know how I wound up in UC Davis, but I, I went to UC Davis. Oh, I know why. I didn't get accepted to UCLA. So, and I said, Davis sounds nice. To this day, I don't know why I didn't go to San Diego, UC San Diego. But anyway, uh, I actually really enjoyed my time there. I, I majored in history, which is also interesting. You know, the two questions that people ask freshmen freshmen when you're, when you're in college is, what are you majoring in and where are you from? And both of those answers, well, I'm majoring in history into an ag science school. They're like, history? Why would you do that? And then when I told them I was from Los Angeles, they were like, Los Angeles, you stole our water. Anyway, so <laughs> that was back in the 80s. I guess I hope now we have 
more water or we survive. But anyway, so this is, this is the heart. And in the valley, the San Fernando Valley, there's a quarter of a million Jewish people. In the state of California, there's over a million Jewish people. And then when you factor in Arizona and Nevada, which are two states that, I'm, that are under our region, there's almost a million and a quarter Jewish people. And so part of the reason why we're here is to encourage you to pray for Jewish people, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And it's always exciting to be in a place where there is a sizable Jewish community that we can share the Jewish Messiah with. Jesus, Yeshua. Yeshua is the Hebrew way to say Jesus. And, and today I did bring some books. One of the ways in which we do share the gospel is through Messianic prophecy. Isaiah 53 is one of the most powerful, probably the most. It's, I like to call it the Babe Ruth of Messianic prophecy, you know, because it's so impactful. I myself came to faith reading this prophecy. Over 90% of Jewish people who've come to faith in Jesus have said that Isaiah 53 has played an important role. And so we, we send out ads through the internet. When Jewish people fill out the uh, disclaimer or the, um, the, the ad for a free book, then we send them Isaiah 53 as a gift. Uh, today, if you sign up for our prayer letter, our newsletter, and I have some brochures on the table out there, you'll receive this, this book as a gift and our hope is that you'll read it, and then you'll, if you have a Jewish person in your life, you would go ahead and pass it along to them, or at least share with them, if you can, some of the contents. I have read this prophecy over the years to many Jewish people, and when I read it to them, some of them will look at I had one person take the Bible out of my hand when I read it to them and started looking over like, is this really from my Bible, the Old Testament, or as Jewish people will say, the, the Tanakh, which is kind of the Hebrew way? The Jewish way to say, they don't say Old Testament because it sounds like it's no longer relevant. But they'll take it and they'll look at the table of contents. I'll say, no, no, it's right here in the, the great prophet Isaiah. I've also read it to some Jewish people and, and, and they've come to faith. I say, who is the prophet? Who is he talking about? And they'll say, well, it sounds like Jesus. I had one Orthodox person say, it, it's Yeshua. And they prayed with me. Uh, to receive the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that that's always going to happen, but it it helps move uh, the ball forward in a person's life when we can share with them pre-New Testament. And not that we don't use the New Testament, but before Jesus was born, how the prophets and how Isaiah, Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Jesus. It also is a very powerful witness for the Bible itself, that the Bible would have these words, these prophecies in them centuries before their fulfillment, and then when they come to fulfillment. And that's going to be part of our message today, how, how the, the, the prophets had foretold Israel's journey in the Scripture. Before we look at the message, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Um, and so after the, after the message, you can meet me at the table back there, and there are other books that are for sale. One of them, too, is this book, The People, the Land, and the Future of Israel, and you can uh, purchase that. And, and some of what I'm talking about today will be in this book. One last thing, and, and you might be thinking, well, how can I get involved in Jewish ministry? One of the ways you can get involved, of course, is to pray. And there will be some prayer points throughout this message. But also another way is we are actually going to be hosting. We have a, a ministry for hosting Israelis. Israelis move throughout the globe. Every Israeli has to go into the army. Well, I say every, at least unless... They, for some reason, um, get exempted. But most Israelis go into the army, and when they do, they spend either three or two years, and afterwards they get a stipend to kind of go and, and sort of, you know, uh, get some rest, so to speak, because it is very stressful. And they, many travel throughout the world, and they, this, may, this is an area where Israelis will travel, and we have a hosting ministry that if you are interested in being a part of, or at least learning more, you want more information, you can go ahead and ask me at the end of the service, and I will, I will send you information that will let you know how you can be trained and how if you have an extra room, you can host an Israeli in your house and ways in which you can show them uh, Christian hospitality and minister to them and hopefully even share the gospel. Well, let's pray and ask God to bless our time. And again, thank you so much for having me here with you this morning and to share with you from God's word and to tell you a little bit about our ministry to the Jewish people. Abba Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord God, 
how you have blessed us with the scriptures. And Father, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray for the Jewish people. I also pray, Lord, for the Palestinians. I pray, Lord God, that they would receive uh, new leadership. And we pray for the end of this conflict. And Father, I pray, I pray for San Francisco, the Bay Area, the peninsula. I pray, Lord God, for Northern California and the state of California. And I pray, Lord God, that the Jewish people would receive a witness, Lord, and that they would come to faith. We pray for revival. But we also pray for the nations, Father. We pray for for our country, Lord. We pray for all the areas where the Jewish people have been dispersed, that when the word goes to them, it will go to the nations as well. And I thank you that that's been your strategy or, or one of them, is that as we follow the Jewish people around the planet, we also share the gospel with the nations. We thank you, Lord, for the good news. And we pray, Lord God, that people would repent and believe. And we're grateful, Lord, that your desire is that none should perish and that all should have a saving relationship with you. Lord, help your church, empower your church, work through your church, Lord God, to minister redemption, to minister the gospel, to minister the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord, our Savior, the Son of God, who loved us and died for us and rose again. Oh, Lord, we thank you and praise you. And as we look into your word, Lord, I pray that we would not just be hearers only, but that we would be doers as well. In Jesus' name, Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. So here you see a map of this is the modern state of Israel, and you're going to notice that that really there are colors, which I'll get into in a moment, but this is the modern state is less. It's not as large yet as what was promised to them in the scriptures. And, And in today's map, you see the green there. That's the West Bank. And you see the purple in the lower, um, I guess that would be your left, left left-hand corner, that's the Gaza Strip. And then up in the top is the Golan Heights. And each one of those colors was uh, claimed by Israel after the Six-Day War in 1967. And these are the areas today of dispute. And so how did we get here? Where did did this uh, crisis that we're looking at today Where did it come from? Now, before we we dig into the biblical history, I want to just say that I was born and raised in a Jewish home, and I did not come to faith in Yeshua or Jesus until I was 23 years old. And and growing up in a Jewish home, I, I really, you know, we were a traditional home. I went to Hebrew school for eight years. I was bar mitzvahed. Uh, I have, uh, ironically, a lot in, in common with Jesus, you know. His mother was Jewish. My mother was Jewish. Right there, I felt a kinship with him. But he traveled around Israel, he had, you know, and celebrated the feasts. And I grew up celebrating the feasts, like Passover, as an example, and, and Sukkot and Hanukkah, as we, as we read about in the scriptures. And so Jesus, you know, celebrated, Jesus lived in Israel. Now, when I was growing up, like I said, I was traditional, We wanted to follow Jewish customs and traditions. I was not orthodox. But one of the things that really united our family and even our community was Israel. We were, as you might hear the term, we were Zionistic. We were Zionists. And and that the working definition, the definition I like to use for that is that Zionism is a belief that the Jewish people have a right to the biblical homeland, a homeland as marked out in the scriptures given by God. And so today we see the, the in a sense, the first fruits of what I believe is the, the promise that God has given. And, and my message today, I'm hoping will be more biblical and historical. And you can, and it'll be a springboard for you if it isn't already, if you haven't already in your studies, and it may even answer some questions or fill in some gaps. I want to turn first to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, starting with verse 3 and then 7. Now, Genesis chapter 12 is the beginning of what's known as the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. Now, his name was Abram at the time, but the Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional covenant. How do we know? Because of the language of the covenant. The language of unconditional covenants is I will. I will do this for you doesn't have anything to do with you per se. I have chosen you and these are the things that I will do. They're not conditional on anything that the receiver must do. It is a gift. 
This is also similar to the new covenant. The, the new covenant is similar, the gospel. I will do this through my son. And, and really, what's, what's you want, want to say, it's not really required, but you have to receive it. And so Abraham received it. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, it says here in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The first component of the Abrahamic covenant is the blessings and the curses. And so God will use Abram to bless the nations. And so that's the first aspect. The second is that he's going to give them offspring. This is going to be really a miracle because at this time, his wife Sarah was barren. He says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, the third, second and third component is a land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar, Abram, to the Lord who appeared to him. And so this promise of the land to the Jewish people and to Abram, who was known as a Hebrew at that time, there's kind of three terms that are used for Jewish people. First, the most ancient is Hebrew. Then the Israelites. The Israelites are all the offspring of Jacob, who had a name change from Jacob to Israel, and his children are the children of Israel. And then finally, Jewish, which is after the tribe of Judah, or Judeans from the southern kingdom, which is the predominant area of the tribe of Judah. And so today, when you, we think of somebody as Jewish, they're really descendants, by and large, of Judah, Ju- because the, the ten tribes of Israel were removed or taken into captivity in 722 BC. So they were removed, so those 10 tribes, nobody really walks around saying, I'm a Gadite or from Issachar. And then Benjamin was absorbed into, into Judah. Now, the Levites, the priestly tribe, of which I am one, my last name is Cohen, so technically you could say I'm from the tribe of Levi, they also have been around because just like Judah, that area, the, the Levites had been running the temple, and after the temple was destroyed, they remained, they contained, they, they kept their priestly or their temple, their temple, um, their temple designation, excuse me, their tribal designation. Let's keep going. Genesis 15, 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So this is a reintroduction to Abram of this covenant. To your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates. So within the context of the Abrahamic covenant, the land area is being laid out. And this is written about 2000 BC. I shouldn't say it's written. This is given around 2000 BC. Moses actually penned this probably around 1500, 1400 BC. Moving from the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, which is a conditional covenant, it is an if-then covenant, if you do this, I will do that, and we get that based at the end from the blessings and the curses that they were commanded when they entered the land to write on Mount Gerizim, the blessings, and Mount Ebal, the curses, and this is conditional. So the blessings within the Mosaic covenant are conditioned on obedience. In Exodus chapter 23, though, verse 31, this land covenant is also mentioned in the Mosaic covenant. It says, and I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates, for I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you, you shall drive them out before you. And so God, within the, within the Mosaic covenant, the covenant, the promise of the land is reiterated. And then to Joshua, Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. Every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. And here's a map of the Davidic kingdom. I like that, you know, the man after God's own heart. Interestingly, you're going to be doing a men's retreat on David. But the height of this promise under the Mosaic covenant was under the Davidic and the Solomonic kingdoms. David and his son, and you can see the Euphrates River to the north, 
the Mediterranean, Lebanon, and then down into Egypt. Now, it's still not the full promise, but it's, it's the most expansive within ancient Israel's borders, and all 10 tri- excuse me, 12 tribes plus the Levites are living within these borders. Now, unfortunately, Israel did not keep to the covenant of Moses. They did not keep to the covenant of Moses. It says in Deuteronomy 28, verse 64, And the Lord will scatter you among all people from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And so in 70 AD, first in 586, well, as I said earlier, 722, the Assyrians came in and took away the northern tribes. God kept his southern kingdom, a remnant, which is also the Judean, Judah, and David, of course, is from the tribe of Judah. So he kept that along with the Levites and, and Benjamin, because Paul was a Benjaminite. And then, and then in 586, that temple was destroyed. Solomon's temple was destroyed. The Israelites or the Judeans were taken into captivity. They came back 70 years later. The Lord came to the second temple that was built under Zerubbabel and then expanded under Herod. Jesus in our New Testament came to that second temple. He was rejected, unfortunately, by national Israel. Of course, Jewish people did accept him. Remember, the apostles, the disciples were Jewish. Jesus is Jewish, and so he's the Jewish Messiah. He came to the Jewish people, and not all Israel rejected him. There's always been a remnant of Jewish people that have believed in Jesus, of which I am one of them. And I know sometimes we forget the Jewishness of our faith. I remember, you know, growing up, I didn't know Jesus was Jewish. I thought Jesus was Catholic. Maybe Calvary or Baptist, had I known what that was growing up. But I didn't know he was Jewish. And that message alone, I still think, is a very important one. But most people were not, most Jewish people especially, are not as ignorant as I was. They know that Jesus is Jewish. I remember witnessing to to one of my family members, and I I said, okay, here I go. You know, Jesus is Jewish. And they're like, I know that. Like, uh uh-oh, okay. But then I went on to say, you know, and the Apostle Paul is Jewish too. That made them fall off their chair. They were like, the Apostle Paul, St. Paul is Jewish? Yes, not only that, but he was, he was really what we would call an Orthodox Jew of today. And so Jesus is Jewish. He went into his temple. He preached. He preached the message um, of, of salvation all throughout Israel, Judea, Samaria, and Judea, and in the temple. But in 70 AD, that temple was destroyed, and, and most people think, well, that's it. The Jewish people, and even, sadly, members of the people, parts of the church, think that's it. Jewish people had their chance. God fulfilled his land promise to them, and in 70 AD, it ended. But that's not what I believe the scriptures say. Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 1, God highlights this land covenant within the book of Deuteronomy, and it's after chapter 28, which is the chapter on the curses. It says, these are the words of the covenant that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab besides the covenant that he had made with them at Horeb. Well, what covenant is that? What covenant is he talking about? Well, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 4 and 5, it is this covenant of the land, which is unconditional. And why? Is because it's part of the Abrahamic covenant mentioned through the Mosaic covenant. But it's, it supersedes this covenant, just like the gospel, as Paul says in Rome, the book of Romans. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 4 and 5, If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and notice the language, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possess, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. This is God's promise to the Jewish people, and I believe that this is still in effect after 70 AD, because when were they scattered throughout the nations? It was after 70 AD when the Romans came in and destroyed that second temple, and that second temple is still destroyed to this very day, and so there is still this diaspora, but in 
And so if you can see this language, God has made a promise that he's going to bring the Jewish people back from all around the globe, all around the planet. Now in Ezekiel 36, verse 24, the great prophet reiterates. Now a lot of times we start with Ezekiel, but I believe it's more important to start with Moses and that the prophet Ezekiel, he is bringing over what Moses said and he is mentioning it to us He says, for I will take you from the nations, gather you out of all the countries and bring you back to your own land. And of course, like I said, Jewish people since 70 AD and again in 134 AD, which was a second revolt against Rome where they were dispersed, that Jewish people had been dispersed throughout the nations as far as Los Angeles and the Bay Area, San Francisco, And interestingly enough, we are the ends of the earth, not in my own heart, of course, but in the heart of the Bible, because what is the center is Jerusalem. And so God dispersed Jewish people in numbers, but he is bringing them back and he has been bringing them back into his land. Israel after 70 AD, just a a brief little highlight of the history of Israel post Bible after Rome We have the Byzantine Empire. So these are the different empires that controlled the promised land. And so it was the time of the Gentiles from 586 BC when Jerusalem was fully conquered until the present day, well, I should say the present day, until 1948, until the British, Israel, Jerusalem had been under the control of the nations. And these are the different net empires But under the Ottoman and the British Empire, the Jewish people started to return. And I believe in fulfillment of biblical prophecy, both Moses and Ezekiel. And Mark Twain visited the Holy Land in 1867. And when he visited the Holy Land in 1867 under the Ottoman era, this is what he had to say about it. He said, a desolate country whose soil is rich enough, but is given over wholly to weeds a silent, mournful expanse, a desolation. We never saw a human being on the whole route, hardly a tree or shrub anywhere. Even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. And so we see that that in the same way that the Jewish people had been dispersed, God had, in a way, been maintaining or at least keeping that land somewhat vacant for the Jewish people. And this was Mark Twain's description during the end of the Ottoman era. In 1948, as the Jewish people were returning and after World War II, the Jewish, the UN decided to adopt a partition of Palestine. Now, let me just pause and look at that word Palestine for a moment. Sadly, a lot of our theological books, they'll say, they'll call that area Palestine. And some people have gone on to even say that Jesus is Palestinian. That is anachronistic. And by anachronistic, I mean we're taking a term that is more modern and we're reapplying it to the scripture. There's nowhere in the scriptures that say that the land is called Palestine. That word Palestine came when the Romans in 134 AD, during the second revolt, of the Jewish people against Rome, and the Romans defeated the Jewish people, they renamed the land Palestina. They renamed it based on the ancient word Philistine, and they did so to insult the Jewish people and to try to wipe out the remnants or the idea that this was once uh, a a Jewish place, a Jewish area. And so they took that name Philistina and they called it Palestina, a Latin derivative after the Philistines. And then they took Jerusalem and renamed it Aelio Capitolina. And eventually a Roman, a Roman temple was built on the Temple Mount. And then um, later the Muslims came in and built the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And so that's, that's a very, very brief history of, of that name Palestine. By the time the British got there after World War I, the Jewish people had already started to return. Interestingly enough, right around the time that Mark Twain made that quote, the Jewish people started to what's called made aliyah or immigration. They, they couldn't live in Europe anymore, especially Eastern Europe. There were too many pogroms, too much violence. 
Those that had gone on to America were going on to America, like my family. My family went from Eastern Europe through Ellis Island to the Holy Land, New York City. And from there, we came to California, the Golden State. But many Jewish people started to trickle into the, um, what was at that time called Palestine. Now, the, the Ottomans didn't really call it Palestine, but the British, and because of our theology books, we, the British mandate called it Palestine. And so before 1948, there were Palestinian Arabs and Palestinian Jews. But on November 29, 1947, the UN voted to partition, and that's the map of the partition. And the, the white the areas were offered to the Jewish people and the gold areas were offered to the Arabs. As you can see, it's a pretty sizable division for both sides. Sadly, the um, Arabs said no to the partition and the Jewish people on May, 19, May, 19, 40, May 14, 1948 said yes, there was a war of the five countries surrounding Israel, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq. Those five countries attacked Israel, and Israel won. And so unfortunately, sadly, the dispersion or the, 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 the refugee situation is started with this, this war for independence that was what happened when the Arabs uh, rejected the, the partition. In 1967, there was the Six-Day War. And the Six-Day War is where Israel um, acquired the West Bank, Gaza, and the Golan Heights. West Bank, Gaza, and the Golan Heights. And those areas have been uh, disputed uh, since. And there's been, there's been numerous opportunities for a quote-unquote two-state solution. Even before Israel became a nation, there were opportunities for a two-state solution. In 1937, um, there was what's called the Peel Commission. There was an option for two-state solution. That was rejected, of course, in 1948. Later, in 1967, right after the war, the, the Israel, because they had these areas that were taken, had, had very large Arab populations. They tried to appeal to the Arab nations to try to figure out a solution. It was at that time that the Arab League adopted their three-no policy, no, no right to exist, no negotiation. Um, and, and, and so this, um, unfortunately, it's been difficult. Then in 2000, at the end of the Oslo period, there was the Camp David Accords that were rejected. All this to say that there have been opportunities for two-state solutions for one reason or another. Uh, it has been rejected. And sadly, with each rejection, the Palestinian people have suffered more and more because of that. And at least as from an outsider's perspective, not wanting to delve too much into the political side of things, but to say that their leadership for some reason has rejected these opportunities for their own nation and it has hurt uh, the people. Ezekiel says in verse 30, chapter 36, 34 to 35, as the nation, as Israel will return to the land, the land will blossom. This desolate land that Mark Twain described now would become a land vibrant and fruitful. The land that was desolate, using the same terminology, will be tilled instead of being a wasteland in the sight of all that passed by. They will say this land that was a wasteland has become like the Garden of Eden. I want to pause and say part of the reason why it was a wasteland until the Jewish people returned was because of the punishment of God. And so it was a way for God, you know, and, and I see the land really as God's land given to the Jewish people. And when they were disobedient to the covenant of Moses, God fulfilled his promise in Deuteronomy 28, verse 64. But then God, by his grace and by his faithfulness, has brought the Jewish people back. And what he said in Moses and in Ezekiel is coming to pass. They will say this land was a wasteland, has become like the Garden of Eden. The waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. And this here picture is from Mount Carmel, looking down at what's known as the Jezreel Valley. By per capita, it's the second exporter of agriculture. Israel's the second exporter of agriculture in the world per capita. Israel is about seven and a half million people 
Interestingly enough, there's over a million Arab Israeli citizens living in Israel today and about a little over 6 million Jews. And so very fruitful uh, Arab and Jew in Israel living together. Also, Jerusalem re-inhabited. And here we see Psalm 122 says that it will be a compact city. It is a compact city. We could see Israel, and this is the... um, looking from the Temple Mount area and from the Dome of the Rock. And then Tel Aviv, the modern city. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was nothing really but orange groves. It was, it's a little bit north of Jaffa, which is the ancient city, ancient port city. Today, uh, a modern metropolis with over 3 million people in the greater Tel Aviv area. And so God is fulfilling his promises. It is becoming even more prosperous than it was under David, under the fathers uh, for the Jewish people. I've had the privilege of going to Israel um, many times. I get to take youth groups. I've taken two youth groups to Israel. We've toured the area. Our mission is to really help these uh, young people grow in their love relationship with Jesus, to understand the Jewish roots of their faith, and to feel a commonality to, with the Jewish people, with Israel, that they might be a strong testimony, a strong testimony that you can be Jewish and believe in Jesus. In Ezekiel 36, verse 36, it also goes on to say, then the nations that are left all around you will know We'll know that I, Adonai, I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places. Ultimately, this is a work of God. This is not a work of just people. It's a work of God, both in the history and in the productivity. And replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, so I will do it. Uh, One of the most recent treaties, in a way, you could say, of the nations around Israel, who were once extremely hostile, some of them have become friendly, or at least are recognizing Israel. Back in 1964, the Arab League, or 67, the Arab League said no recognition, no right to exist, no recognition, and no negotiation. That was their policy. Today, we see these nations right here. Is a picture of the most recent um, Abrahamic Accords, as they've been known, where the Gulf nations around the Persian Gulf, UAE and Bahrain, have come and made peace with Israel. Earlier, Egypt in 1977 and Jordan in 19, I believe, 1994. And so two of the nations that attacked Israel have now have peace treaties. And then two uh, in the Persian Gulf area. And there were, there were going to be more. Sadly, the October 7th crisis hindered the ability of more of these countries. But that's my understanding is that more of these nations were going to recognize Israel and start to normalize uh, relations with them. Um, those that are holding out, their covenant is not, their, their war really is not with Israel, but it's with the God of Scripture. That's what it says in Psalm 83, verse 4 and 5. It says, they say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let them Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. Verse 5, for they conspire with one accord. They conspire with one accord. Against you, they make a covenant. And so we need to pray against those who want to harm Israel and the Jewish people. But of course, we also need to pray for those that are bystanders in all this. Uh, Those family, those Arabs, those Palestinians that just want peace and want to live in a, in a world of, of peace where, where both sides can get along. And, and of course, we know the only way for true peace is when the Prince of Peace returns. But until then, there can be, we can pray for peace. We can pray for peace and for the end of the conflict. I believe that part of the reason, well, there are many reasons, I think, why God is bringing the Jewish people back. And of course, one is the fulfillment of his promises. Sometimes there is no real why. It's God's land. He chose these people to give the land to. And part of it was so that people would know that he is the God. The God of the Bible is the God of creation and the God of redemption. And we can see him laying out his plan. We also see this in Messianic prophecy as well. As God fulfilled Messianic prophecy, those prophecies that speak to Jesus, like Micah 5, 2, where it says he would be born in Bethlehem. And of course, we sang those songs less than a month ago, a little town of Bethlehem. 
uh, as one. Isaiah 7, 14, the Emmanuel prophecy that the virgin would, would, would um, give birth and bring forth a child, and we would call him Emmanuel. And so these prophecies declare God, the God of the Bible, is the God of creation and the God of redemption and the God, our, our creator. In the same way, bringing Israel back to the land also reveals God's faithfulness, that he's true to his promises. In the same way he's true to the, his promises with Israel, he's true, it's true for us. And also bringing Israel back so that national Israel will repent. There are still Arab nations that are hostile with Israel, like Iran and Hezbollah, which is in southern Lebanon, and Hamas, and maybe even Turkey and Ethiopia, possibly, and Libya and Sudan and uh, Russia and China. And we think of Ezekiel 38. And so now that Israel is coming back into the land, these nations that may be forming a coalition against Israel to attack her, that these are part of the birth pangs of the Lord's return. And part of the Lord's return is that all Israel will be saved. That God has has reserved a remnant. As I said, I came to faith roughly 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I became a believer in Yeshua in my 20s. I am part of the remnant that was promised in Romans chapter 11, verse 5. But God also promises that one day all Israel will be saved. And part of that birth pang is the the um, part of those birth pangs is is Isra- the pressure that is being put on Israel to ultimately recognize that they can't live in their own strength. We all struggle with that. This latest conflict uh, on October seventh, ironically, happened on what's known as Simchat Torah, the joy of Torah, which is a Jewish holiday in which they rejoice and dance, and and this conflict that's been ongoing has been anything but joy for both sides. And of course, as the church, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And specifically, what's interesting about the peace of Jerusalem is that the next clause says that those who love you will dwell securely, safely. And so part of that is that the Palestinian people and all people, as they recognize Israel, and that doesn't mean Israel is always right, It just means recognizing God's promises and that ultimately God will superintend this situation and that we want peace. That those that do pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they will rest securely. That that is a promise in Scripture. This is part of the ongoing, which I've already sort of listed these, so I'm not going to go over them again. But this is sort of the period um, of the ongoing rejection that there are elements on both sides uh, that... that, um, may not want peace. But again, ultimately, our God is the God of peace. He's the Prince of Peace, and He will bring peace. And, and as there's pressure, there's pressure on Israel, um, one day all Israel will repent. I want to turn to Zechariah. If we can turn to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. How will this happen? Well, as I said in that map earlier, as the nations converge against Israel, as there's more pressure, as Israel sees that they can't do this in their own strength, it says in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, one of the prophets, 500 years before the birth of Jesus, says, and on that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. As we recognize and keep an eye on these coalitions, as we look to the, the final consummation, there will be the inhabitants surrounding Jerusalem, armies will come, and when they do, Israel will no longer be able to rest in her own strength, but will have to look upon him whom they've pierced. And, and that's national Israel again. There's always been a remnant of Jewish people that have believed in Jesus, but national Israel will look upon him whom they've pierced, and they will repent. It is a promise in Scripture. Right now, 
about 99% of the Jewish people, 98% of the Jewish people do not yet believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It's changing, especially in Israel. There are more Jewish people today believing in Jesus. There are more Jewish people today that recognize that, hey, it's okay to believe in Jesus. Uh, there are more <laughs> Jewish people today that are even investigating, especially in Israel, who Jesus is and, and investigating whether he is the Messiah or not. And so God is doing a work. I believe we are close. We may be the generation that will see national Israel's salvation or uh, the rapture, the return of the Lord. And they're going to recognize him as the pierced one. One of the most recognizable ways to recognize Jesus, our Messiah, is that he was pierced. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, he was pierced for our transgressions. And that piercing is also for the Jewish people and for the promises that God made for them. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, it says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the nations has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. So partial hardening has come to Israel, partial meaning not all, again, a remnant, until the fullness of the nations could come in. And that could ultimately mean the rapture, that these events will occur after the rapture, the fullness, both in quantity and in quality. After the church has been removed and has received the fullness of their relationship, their new bodies, it would be at that time that Israel would recognize that they have missed who the Messiah is and that it's Jesus it says, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I, again, unconditional language, I take away their sins. You know, none of us really deserve salvation. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Israel's sins or Israel's rejection of Messiah, we've seen throughout the centuries, but all people need Jesus their Messiah, the Messiah, the Savior for eternal life. All have to confess with their mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God has raised them from the dead. Israel's, national Israel's rejection meant salvation for the nation, part of God's plan. And Israel's acceptance is also part of God's plan as we see right here. And our role as the church is to continue, I believe, to pray Romans 11.11 11 says that we are called to provoke them to jealousy. We are called in Romans 11, by their transgression, salvation has come to the nations to provoke them to jealousy. In Matthew chapter 23, 37 to 39, Jesus said this about his return. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered you children together as a hen gathers her brood? under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. And so far, all this has happened, right? National Israel's rejection, Jesus wanting to bring her in. The house, the temple is left desolate. But he doesn't stop there. He says, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say. So there is a mechanism for his coming and appearing before Israel Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I believe that is what the prophet Zechariah is saying in verse 10. They will, and how are they going to do that? When God pours out that spirit of grace and supplication. Again, unconditional. There will be a time when God will do that. Blessed be his name. Paul says this in Romans eleven twenty eight and 29. As regards to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regard to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And so God's gift, I believe, of the land, based on that land covenant, that unconditional covenant, is irrevocable. And it's part of the way in which we know that his return is near return is near. I mean, that's also a blessing for us. The conflict that's going on, and we need to pray for the end of the conflict. I believe that's important. Pray for the end of the conflict. Pray for the children, family, and friends. Pray for the hostages to come home. Pray to comfort the mourning 
wherever the morning is, that's we're to bless those who we're to pray for the morning, we're to comfort them, we're to be hospitable. Pray for ministries that work in the land. There are many ministries that work in the land right now. We need to pray for them. Um, we need to pray that those uh, that need supplies, housing, there are many people displaced, uh, food, shelter, uh, care for their children as families are stretched to the breaking point. Pray uh, regarding your role. Where would God have you in this conflict, in, in this great um, restoration? Where does God see each one of us? Pray for your Jewish family, friends, neighbors. Some of you have Jewish family members, friends, neighbors, work associates. Pray for them. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the second coming. Pray for your enemies, our enemies of the gospel, to repent and God's plans. And pray for, as I said a moment ago, the Messiah's return. That's just some prayer points that you can utilize Again, if you would like to learn more, if maybe you want to host an Israeli as they come through and provide hospitality to them. Maybe you want to learn more about how to reach your Jewish family member or friends. You can go ahead and fill out the brochure, receive the book as a gift. Again, uh, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to come and to share with you from God's word. It's been a great blessing to be here with you this morning. And I, I'm going to close my time with a prayer uh, this is a benediction from the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. And if you want to stand, you may. Yivrech Adonai v'yishma recha Ya'er Adonai panavalecha v'yichunecha Yisadonai panavalecha May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you shalom, give you peace. And may you just go forth in the joy of the Lord. In his name, in Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Shalom and thank you very much. Bye-bye.